<laughs> so Jim Radcliffe has been given quite an in-depth interview and he was asked who he wants to see win the Premier League and he said, I hate them all. They're all the enemy. It would be good for Arteta, actually. It would be good for him because he's done really well and Arsenal have been patient with him, which is nice as well. So, Rob, putting two and two together in this situation in that he likes it when clubs give managers time and Ten Hag... Hasn't had too much. He's had a bit of time, but maybe not as much time as Arteta's had. Is there a suggestion that he's favouring Ten Hag to stay? I don't think we can stretch it that far. Um, Ten Hag hasn't been given any kind of guarantees by Sir Jim Radcliffe or his right-hand man, Sir Dave Brailsford, that he's going to continue in his job next season. He, at the moment, he has got a contract. He signed a three-year deal when he came in from Ajax. That contract runs until 2025. So, in theory, he has got another year left, but until Sir Jim Radcliffe or Dave Bailsford comes out and says beyond any shadow of a doubt that Eric Ten Hag is staying his manager next season, there are going to be doubts about whether that is, is the case or not. And that's down to the fact that this has been a really poor season for Man United. The, the two things that cost managers their jobs are poor results and new, man, and new owners sorry, coming in. And at the moment, Eric Ten Hag is dealing with both of those things. Obviously, there's still a chance that he may turn this season around. It's possible that he could win the FA Cup, they could still scrape into the Champions League um, next season. I, I think, though, still that, that Sir Jim Radcliffe is looking at that manager's position and thinking, is he the right man for the job? And there's an awful lot of question marks about that at the moment. Do you like Mark Ogden, Rob? <laughs> what, personally? Or yeah. As... Yeah, I think he's all right, yeah. Well, that was not the most convinced, because I'm wondering if it's like a rivalry between the Manchester correspondents uh, when it comes to, it comes to the big stories. The reason I bring that up is because Mark has been writing about the special relationship that Ineos, of course, part of the new ownership of Manchester United, and Gareth Southgate seem to have, and that is why Gareth Southgate, when you have a look at the odds uh, as to who is going to be the next Manchester United manager, is in the equation. And, Rob, I can't imagine that Manchester United fans are particularly excited, given Gareth Southgate's domestic form, that uh, Southgate is favourite to take over. Yeah, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, I can understand the, the interest in Gareth Southgate from Sir Jim Radcliffe's point of view, because if you're judging it on purely on fit, Jim Radcliffe wants a manager to come in who's going to work in, a, in an overall structure. Um, reporting to a sporting director is likely to be Dan Ashworth working with a head of recruitment and a, a head of performance. United in the past have given managers an awful lot of power, more power than perhaps they would get at other clubs. And Sir Jim Radcliffe wants to end that. He, he wants the manager to be a cog in the machine and not this sort of overbearing overlord who, who can do what they want. Um, the days of, of that, you know, we used to see with Sir Alex Ferguson, no day, those days are over. And so when you look at it from a fit perspective, Gareth Southgate fit, ticks a lot of boxes. He knows Dan Ashworth very well. Um, from the FA, he knows to Dale Brailsford from working with, with Ineos. So on that side of the debate, you could understand it. What well, you're right pointing out what the fan reaction may be. You know, Gareth Southgate hasn't managed a club game for 15 years. And even then, he, he took Middlesbrough down into the Championship um, and was sat trying to get them promoted back to the Premier League. He's done a good job as England manager. He's got them to a World Cup semi-final. He's got them to a Euros final but even then there are still some England fans who think he's still pragmatic he's not adventurous enough he doesn't pick enough exciting players so you can understand why Gareth Southgate may be attractive proposition as Man United manager to Sir Jim Radcliffe but the fans aren't, aren't particularly sold and it will take an awful lot of, of PR around that appointment to convince Man United fans he's the right man for that job. What's more likely at the start of next season Ron? Ten Hag or Southgate to be in charge? Honestly, I think it's it's completely up in the air. I, I think I don't think that that Sir Jim Radcliffe has made a decision on his manager. Um, certainly, the people around Eric Ten Hag are saying that they don't think that he's made a decision. Um, Eric Ten Hag, for what it's worth, understands that he's he's under pressure because this season hasn't been good enough. But he also doesn't think that he's a dead man walking. He thinks he has time to turn this around and convince Radcliffe that he's the man to take them forward next season. I think a lot may depend on what happens between now and the end of the season. It, if they were to win the FA Cup and get into the Champions League, it would be very, very hard for Ineos to part ways with, with Eric Ten Hag. Also, on top of that, you've got the compensation that would be due to him and his staff. You're talking of upwards of, of £10 million at a club where money is already tight because of FFP restrictions. So there are all these things come into play 
Um, I think these are a, a crucial couple of months now for Eric Ten Hag if he wants to stay as Man United manager. Southgate makes no sense at all. I mean, Southgate coming in would mean that the fans, in my opinion, would be against them before they even kicked the ball. Why would you do Which that? Which we've seen Which we... is, is never, I mean, he's ever not, a good point. Yeah, so. he's not a coach that, that has ever and, and, and makes you think of front foot football. You know, we're complaining about how Man United play and look how City play, how do Liverpool play, how do Arsenal play, oh, how do the best teams play? Well, they play going forward, they play on the front foot. You, you don't have Gareth Southgate and, and that sort of football in the same breath. So if he appoints Gareth Southgate, before a ball's kicked, the fans are going to be grumbling. Uh, Ten Hag wins the FA Cup, give him the job. Well, that's the, sort of the ironic part for Manchester United fans, that they'll be more than happy to win FA Cup, but then that's also him essentially securing his position as the manager of the future for Manchester United. So you have to ask yourself as a Manchester United fan, is this what you really want? Because in winning FA Cups, does, then, does that then do away with the struggles, all the struggles? Are you able to put everything behind you and say, you know what, everything Hag was right all along, and he is the guy for the future. And he's not really the guy for the future, given the fact that, guess what, with new ownership, they're always sort of looking over his shoulder. They're always sort of lingering. And so I think the worst thing that could happen for Manchester United is that they do just well enough, that they give just enough signs for Ten Hag to continue on, and then next season starts and is back to the beginning, back to square one. And back to square one hasn't been good for Ten Hag or Manchester United to go searching for a manager once again. Because guess what? That new ownership, if he was barely hanging on, the moment that the team struggles once again, they're going to be on him right away, and they're going to try to make a change right away. So if you're going to make a change, if that's part of your plans for the future as a new ownership, then do it. Do it, regardless of what happens in the FA Cup or not. Uh, aside from who the new manager might be, what about new members of the squad that can join under Sir Jim Radcliffe in this summer? Well, this is what he had to say. Uh, it's not that clever buying Mbappe. Anyone could figure that one out. More challenging is to find the next Mbappe or Bellingham or Roy Keane. Uh, to this point, it may be not that clever to buy Mbappe, but Manchester United are one of few clubs that could afford that calibre of player, Rob. And it seems a little... It, it seems a little silly. If you've got the ability to bring in those sort of players, why would you start, like Chelsea, for example, start hanging around for youngsters you can pay a lot of money for because you think they're going to bloom later on? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the wider point that Radcliffe is making there is that he's seen over the last 10 years that United's recruitment has been based around buying expensive superstars. You know, you're talking about the likes of Angel Di Maria and Paul Pogba, players who came in on massive fees with big reputations and, and failed to deliver at Old Trafford. So the wider point that he's making is that instead of trying to target these superstars, and, and you know, let's, you know, don't forget that they've absolutely no chance of signing Kylian Mbappe, even if they wanted to. He's going to Real Madrid. So forget that one. But he's, he's, he doesn't want to target these established superstars. What he's suggesting is that they will look to buy younger talent and nurture it themselves. Now, United have, have tried to do that alongside buying established stars in the past as well, and even that hasn't worked out. The, it, the recruitment overall over the last decade has, has been, hasn't been up to scratch at all, and, and that's why they've fallen behind the likes of Man City and Liverpool. So they need to sort the recruitment department out. You know, beyond picking who the manager's going to be or, or who the players are going to be, they need to sort that recruitment department out. They need to have guys in place best in class, who can identify these players and slot them into a squad and, and make them title challenges again, because for too long it's just not happened. No, they spent a lot of money, wasted a lot of money, uh, which could, of course, be invested better. But it's a balance, isn't it, Stevie? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the superstars come once you've got the club on a solid base with some, some good young players, some good experienced players, and you're on the up, and then you start adding your superstars to take you to the, to the Champions League or take you to fighting for the Premier League. So I think right now, regardless, you wouldn't get an Mbappe. Nobody, nobody of that elite talent is mm. going to look at Manchester United right now. And so it's a, it's a process, and United fans just have to realise that it's going to take a rebuild. 
and, and it comes from the bottom. You've got to start at the bottom and build the core and then you start building it up and then you start bringing in superstars. But the recruitment, 100%, is what it's down to. You know, you look around at the top teams and their recruitment has been absolutely spot on. Yes, they've spent a lot of money, but they've got it right. And that's why your Arsenal's in Liverpool and City are fighting for Champions League and Premier League. Man United have to start again. If they, and if they're going to start again, then it begs the question, is Ten Hag the guy for that rebuild? Is, is he the guy to nurture this young talent? Given the evidence that we have seen so far, it would seem that the answer to that is a very clear no. So I go back to your last question then. FA Cup or not, you cannot make a decision based upon the fact that you win FA Cup or not because it, it, it's a very short-sighted decision-making process and it gets you into trouble because you're saying, because we won FA Cup, then everything must be well with this club and that's not the case. And, and if you're going to do a rebuild, you have to have a clean start, including with the manager. Think about it rationally. Before the Liverpool game in the FA Cup, uh, a sound defeat would have spelt the end for Ten Hag. So how does winning one game and then possibly two more change to you're the man to build this club? It don't make any sense. If the club is indeed going to go through a rebuild, questions around, well, where does Bruno Fernandes fit within that restructure? This is what he had to say about his form this season. At Manchester United, it hasn't been a successful season individually. I'm perfectly aware that I have the capacity to do more and better as always. But this is one of the things that United are going to have to address going forward, isn't it, Rob? Because if you want to, as Stevie says, completely start from the bottom of this club, you need someone within that attacking midfield role to do a lot better than Bruno Fernandes has been. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand why he said that today. His performances haven't been at a level that, that we've expected at Man United. You know, the, the numbers of goals and assists... Um, when he first came in from Sporting Lisbon, were an awful lot higher than they have been this season. I, I think probably he would argue that he's been playing in a, in a particularly poor team and it's very, very hard for creative players um, to, to perform well in teams that are underperforming. Um, I think that maybe whoever the manager is next season or whoever's looking at the, the recruitment over the summer will probably think that that United squad has bigger problems than Bruno Fernandes. They, they need another striker. They need one centre half. They probably need a midfielder. They need at least one fullback. You know, Bruno Fernandes has got his shortcomings and he's taken an awful lot of criticism um, from outside the club, but also from inside. You know, there are Man United fans who don't think that he should be Man United captain, that he's not the right character for that role. But when you talk about that squad and, and, you, and you look about the work, you look to see the work that needs to be done to fix that squad. I think there are bigger problems probably than, than Bruno Fernandes. Uh, well, let's address uh, another long-term Manchester United player who was exceptional at uh, the weekend. It was the Marcus Rashford that Manchester United were hoping for when they handed in that big contract. Obviously, this season has been a massive letdown. And in one, on one side, you could look, yes, this is exactly what Marcus Rashford can offer you going forward and defending. But then you also say, well, hey, why is it taking the second half an FA Cup quarter final for us to see this from Marcus Rashford when we've seen it so little throughout the rest of this season. Yeah, and that's exactly it. I don't think anyone is arguing that Marcus Rashford hasn't got the talent and the ability. The problem that has been, ever since he made his debut as a teenager, the problem he's faced is not finding that consistency. He found it a little bit last season, post-World Cup, and managed to end the season with 30 goals. But we just haven't seen it um, often enough. You know, the, the top players, the players that he wants to be mentioned alongside, the likes of Mbappe, Haaland, Salah, you know, these top, top tier forwards, they do it week in, week out. They score every single week, or not just score, they contribute, whether it's goals or assists. And Marcus Rashford hasn't done that. You know, there are, there are games and spells of, of the season where he will score three goals in three games or five goals in five games, but then it'll be another 20 before he registers a, a goal and an, or an assist. And that's just not good enough for someone that really should be hitting the peak of their, their career. Um, and someone who wants to be mentioned as, as one of the best players in the world. Um, it's really going to be a challenge for, for Marcus now to, to find that consistency because he's just not going to be, he's not going to be classed as a world-class player until he can do that. And, and this season is a case in point. You know, last season he did really well, scored 30 goals, this season, he's been nothing like at the same level. And there was even a point in the season where he lost his place in the team entirely because Ten Hag couldn't trust him defensively. 
You know, he can't pick and choose the games he performs in. It can't just be quarterfinals of the FA Cup against Liverpool. It has to be after the international break against Brentford away. It has to be against Luton at home. It has to be every single week. So what happens? You've got Manchester United who want to be fighting once again with Arsenal, Manchester United, Liverpool domestically in the Premier League, with Real Madrid, with Bayern Munich, with PSG in Europe. Yet you've got Marcus Rashford, who wouldn't get into any of those teams oh. on a massive contract. Mm -hmm. You've got Bruno Fernandes, who wouldn't get in any of those teams in the starting eleven. Yet, as, as Rob said, you've got such a big rebuild, that's almost down the list of your priorities at the moment. But it's going to be a big problem, isn't it, when you're trying to get this consistent rebuild going? And I think that takes us back to Ten Hag. You know, we all you have to do is look look down south and look at look at Spurs. Look at the job the Posta Coglu is doing. Now that's man management. It's not just coaching. It's not just X's and O's. It's man management. He's got every single one of those Tottenham players playing way above what they did last year. Ten Hag has got Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford playing way below what they did last year. So, it's not just coaching tactics, it's man management. And it goes back to the manager. You bring another manager in who gets people like Rashford on their toes. Every single... Alex Ferguson was a master at keeping people on their toes. Klopp's a master at keeping people on his toes. It, it looks like Arteta's the same. You, you look at all the top managers, players under them are consistent because they keep them on the toes. Marcus Rashford has been strolling around for seven months this season. Yes, a lot of it's down to him, but it's down to the manager as well. This is a concern, though, isn't it? If you're nice in. Well, yes, yeah, so because let, let's spin it forward. And let's just say that because of the contractual situation, you can't really move Bruno Fernandes or you can't move Marcus Rashford, and they're going to be part of the rebuild, if you will. And you're now sort of leaning and trying to train with younger guys. What do you think the reaction of Bruno Fernandes is going to be when he is sitting on the bench and a younger guy is playing ahead of him consistently? Does he come across as a sort of guy that he's going to be, go on, young guys, yeah, I believe in you. Uh, you're, we're the best. No, 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 no. The profile of Bruno Fernandes is a guy that if he's sitting on the bench, he is pitching a fit. And he is bringing people with him to pitch a fit. And now you have a malcontent. And you have a malcontent. It's not ideal when you're doing a rebuild and when you're trying to push younger guys and you're trying to ba build a base for the future. It doesn't quite match what you're trying to do and the personalities that you have available. And so if indeed this is about a rebuild, then those guys, in particular Bruno Fernandes, if I were Manchester United, I'd be thinking about a future without him very quickly. Uh